Um, in 20 minutes, no more, I want to argue that in translation studies internationally, we know quite a bit about the relationship between a text and a translation and between a translation and its text. What we don't know about is how our translations are received. And here I mean by flesh and blood, readers and listeners, audience, public in the case of interpreting and audiovisual. And I want to propose that we should know more about actual reception. There are several reasons for this. One is, as we've just seen, there is a noble literary tradition in which close expert reading is enough. And the way experts read a text is the only legitimate reading of that text. However, what we find when we do even the most basic empirical research is that readers are incredibly different. And much of what they do defeats the presuppositions that we bring to translation studies, including even the most basic presuppositions about the ways in which different kinds of translation affect different receptions. Now, I to share the screen. I hope you can see that. Here is a classic case. And I'm just going to deal with uh, some of the uh, classic debates that are out there around concerning uh, the translation of Chinese poetry. Uh, as you can see, we've got Li Bai, you've just heard of him, and we've got the text and two translations. Uh, what's interesting here is that this comparison is embroiled in debates about who should translate Chinese literary texts into English, for example. Should it be uh, the L1 speaker of China, the Messiaht, which is fine there, or should it be the English speaker who is absorbing and manipulating the China story? And most of the research that I find uh, manages to locate infelicities or mistakes in translations by the L1 English speakers because they fail to capture not only the deep cultural significance, but beyond that, the beauty of Chinese verse. Now, that is a debate that can continue forever and has sort of preordained outcomes. Now, what we did, no, one of my students did it. I just marked her paper this week. I spent the week marking students' papers. She got these two translations and got people to vote. Which do you prefer? Very, very simple exercise. And we got 21 votes for the Chinese and nine votes for the American. So this is democratically the most beautiful translation. Decided. No, not at all, because when you look at them closely, these nine people, seven were L1 speakers of English. The English was their mother tongue. So what we find, just on this very, very quick little survey, you could do it in 10 minutes, we find that English speakers find more beauty there, and Chinese speakers find more beauty there. Where is beauty? Well, if beauty were universal, we would not need the trans. We another debate. This is a classic one. You can find it on the internet everywhere. Uh, we have uh, this line uh, rendered as "bitter is the west wind," and debates about whether or not the west wind should really be the west wind when it goes into English. Uh, the west wind here is supposed to be bitter, uh, meaning bitterly cold. But we can find in John Maysfield, the wind, the west wind. And the argument is that in Britain, the west wind is not necessarily cold. It can be warm. So should we translate west wind by east wind or north wind or south wind? Tell you the north wind is very cold. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a bit crazy for me. Uh, the debates are about between uh, literal and free, as if there were just two options facing a translator. I think it's a binary option. I think there are many, many more considerations. 
And I would ask you to consider why reader supposed to be in Britain and reading Macefield about a warm wind. I'm at the moment in Melbourne, in Australia, reading this text, and the wind comes from the West. It can be bitterly cold. Okay? How do you know where the reader is? Second, does anybody think that when I'm reading a Chinese text, I have to think about the winds around me now? No. The scene is set in China, and so I will learn about the values of the winds in China. That's what I learn when I play Mahjong. Come on. You have to know, quickly, just by asking people, where is the reader, and how does the reader construct that scene? Is the scene constructed in one culture, in the other, or in some place outside of that binary opposition? Throughout the work on translation and on literary reception in general, we have a noble list of people working in the hermeneutic in general, hermeneutics and phenomenology, making assumptions about reception on the basis of their expert readings of texts. In none of these people, and I'm including the people who have the hermeneutic approach to translation, uh, in Germany, basically, in none of them are they prepared to go out and ask flesh and readers what we have are people talking about text with supposed expert readings and debates between experts. If you want to know, however, what translation can change in the world, how could a translated text make a person appreciate the foreign culture? engage with it, want to find out more about it, or indeed change their own behavior, then you need more than a coterie of expert readers. The problem is the studies that set out to locate the effects of different ways of translating have mostly failed. Uh, the first one was 1991. Uh, by uh, Ella Stegerman, which is just translations and readers. And uh, Stegerman looked at the different uh, translations of uh, a Dutch novel and found out that the differences, the different receptions, were very, very minor. Uh, readers did not change radically, even when the translation strategies changed radically. And so this was incredibly disappointing. Uh, that sort of put a hold on research on empirical reception for uh, about 15 years. Uh, I want to move forward to these two studies uh, about readers being lost in a foreign land, and it's about what uh, foreignization means in, in translation. Now, I, I don't believe in literal versus free. I think that's too simple. Similarly, I don't believe in domestication versus foreignization. That is incredibly simple. But what was done here in this research, as you might know, they get two Chinese versions of the novel Gone with the World. One reputed to be domestic, the other reputed to be foreign. And they ask 36 people to answer questions about it. what to find no significant differences. That the foreign did necessarily mean the unfamiliar, the alien, that people were not really lost in a foreign land. This was followed up by a later study that you might know about as well, when they're testing 143 readers. And we find that the two translations, the academics say are different, more indistinguishable than distinguishable. That is, the research set out to find the effects in reading of two different trans strategies, and they found that the effects were not that great. You can see that here in the 10 questions that they asked people. They found significant, narrowly significant differences for only three of those 10 questions therefore leading to the assumption that there's more similarity than difference in them. The sad news may be 
that, hey, it doesn't matter how you translate, people are going to receive the way they receive. But I think the more important news for us as researchers is that foreignness and foreignization may be not a thing. For example, if I look at all those, all 10 questions, which are readers' questions, let's say each one of those is a separate variable. There is no reason for lumping them together and assuming that it is one coherent strategy. And indeed, when you look very closely at any translation, you will find instances that go towards that culture, followed very quickly by instances that go to the other. And there's far more of a complex mix. I think what's been discovered here is that the reading process is far more complex than our, our very simple analytical strategies, uh, analytical concepts for translations and genes. Now, I've been doing work on, but because I'm old, I don't really do the work. I have doctoral students who do it, and you've got five of them there, and I've got about four minutes. So I'm going to show you just one of these uh, doctoral uh, projects that are going on. Which one shall we look at? I think we'll go to Bay, all right, over here. Uh, Hubei has published recently in Target about her PhD, which was finished this year. That's her there. I'm borrowing her work and citing work. She has got different readers of Chinese foreign affairs discourse. And she finds that, not surprisingly, the more the reader knows about China, presumably the official translators in China would be the expert readers, the greater their preference for low intervention, for not changing. And we would therefore assume that the readers who know less about China, our Australian students who failed really miserably on a, on a comprehension test about China, they would appreciate more adaptation to where they are and more explanations. Now, what they found was more interesting than that. Uh, and this is important because people to love a country, you have to communicate with them on a, a, a level that's not merely comprehension of texts. You've got to win what the Christian tradition has called hearts and minds. Two things came out of this research. First, that um, exoticisms, the pieces of poetry. I, I gave a talk about peaches and plums there uh, being referred to in a, in a speech by, by your president. Uh, this really works, that the foreign readers really do engage in the exotic unknown, even when they know they don't fully understand. The beauty, and here is the aesthetic function, makes them want to know more about it. Uh, and that is neither domesticating or foreignation. It's using the acts of beauty. Maybe something quite different. Uh, and the second surprising finding was that excessive domestication did not work either. People who knew little about China and they're receiving, you know, website texts, it sounds too close to the reader. If it sounds too domesticated, the reaction from the reader was, in many cases, oh, it's too good to be true. I don't believe it. Okay? And uh, it's been manipulated. That excessive uh, uh, bringing of the discourse towards the position of the reader uh, lost trust. That domestication led to a lack of trust. And this is the key finding. Uh, when you pursue it, as Bay is pursuing it, and she'll be having another article coming out very soon, I hope, on precisely this point, uh, we find that people, when they read, are not doing so in terms of the one variable, like uh, the con continuum from literal to free or from domestication to foreignization. It's not one line that they're working on. Uh, their responses when they talk about their readings and compare translations are very often in the case of two or three variables, two or three different things that they are weighing up. 
Uh, for example, uh, oh, this translation has long explanations. Oh dear, I don't long explanations because I have to work too hard. But sometimes it's really important. And if it's important, I'll read the long explanation. What's happening to variables and importance. And the readers, if they find a, a trade-off between those two, the trade-off is an equilibrium. When those two values are met equally well or well enough, uh, so one doesn't dominate the other, to engage in the text proceeds. That reading is not a random activity. It's certainly complex. Realizations of reading have psychological validity in terms of one or two or three, usually two, uh, values which are in a trade-off. Similarly there, oh, it's good to put in those exotic poetic bits in the text. That works quite well. But as long as I don't really have to understand what it means, I can appreciate the aesthetic value, but I know it compromises my comprehension as long as there's a between those two, we can proceed. When the balance is not found, for example, if there are too many incomprehensible exotic bits, this results in information overload and the reading stops, the text is abandoned. Okay? Uh, we find these tipping processes where attention goes too far down one variable. For example, one strategy may be applied excessively uh, to the detriment of other values in the text. Trust is lost. Trust means the reader no longer accepts this as a valid representation of an anterior text. And once trust is lost, the whole thing is lost. That's all I really have to say to you. I urge uh, translator researchers, translation researchers, to look empirically at flesh and blood readers, to move beyond the implied reader and debates between expert readers, and to take seriously the variety way people respond to different translations. We know that there are some effects, but the effects are not linear. They are not simpler. And I'm hoping short of this kind of research on the relatively unknown erection will have a washback effect and we can start to get more complex for the ways we translate. I thank you very much for your attention. Okay.